Welcome, welcome, everybody. Just wait a few more seconds. As people start joining. Welcome, welcome. Welcome, welcome. You're just joining. If you're able to put on your mute button, if you know how to do that. Hopefully after three years of Zoom, you know where it is. Welcome. So I'm gonna start us off and I'm Joanna Kerr. I think I know everybody here. Uh, this is our first ever friends and family event, and there might be more. Um, I've put on a fire, as you can see uh, behind me, and I've made myself a cup of tea. And um, I just want to start by acknowledging the beautiful land upon which I am uh, living and playing and working. This is the Ashnebek and Huron Wendat territories about two and a half hours north of Toronto. And we have this beautiful sunny day after days and days of rain and snow and hail. And I'm aware that some of you out west are finally, finally getting the rain that you so desperately need. So before I turn it over, I thought we would start with a video. Part of, part of what we wanna do here is kind of open the doors to make way. And we've just, finished this beautiful video uh, as people come in about our, our latest staff retreat. So it's just a few minutes. So Sade, if you can hit the play and we can, we can watch this video together. Sounds good, one sec. You can all put your cameras off and just sit back and relax. I fundamentally believe that the work we do together inside Make Way, how we support one another, how we listen and change perspectives and transform our ways of doing and being and seeing internally across all of our diversities, across all of the challenges that we're facing. Um, that is the work, that is the work that you do if you're part of an organization that is actually trying to transform systems and cultures and behaviors and actions and policies. To ask you to think about yourselves and to find that best place to hear about who you are. You recognize these green shirts downtown sure quite a do. lot? Sure do. Like it, this is like a sense of community in itself. And really the only way we're gonna see change is is people really committed to that transformative work and, and integrating this into their lives every single day. Uh, it can't just be a policy you put on your website. But I also acknowledge your point that it is hard to hold authentic relationships and build authentic relationships across huge geographies of different communities and different cultures. And I think that getting brave about more relational approaches to philanthropy is important. My grandmother's advice to me was to help people in taking that initiative um, because other people might have a difficult time asking for help so it could change their day or even their lives by just taking that first initiative. Just learn to be more vulnerable and be more true to yourself and coming into your, to your own um, will continue to impact those around you. Find your center, your awareness to your belly, whatever it is that might help steady you here. We're gonna be here for one more deep breath. And exhale, releasing, coming back up and gently releasing the leg. I really think about um, systems and how systems integrate and how they connect, but really how to sense make, really how to make meaning out of all of this. You know, I think that uh, 
for me over the last year, I've realized, you know, we're, only, we're all only here for a certain amount of time and, and, and we have this opportunity to make an impact. And I think that understanding how these systems connect, these forest systems and how to honor and respect and think about, um, you know, I think sometimes we think about the environment as fragile and we don't understand oh. how resilient and beautiful and strong it is. And it's, it's us, it's us and our motivations and our political failings and our failings to actually stand up and try to make a difference that's the problem. It has nothing to do with nature and natural systems and what they can do. People keep saying, oh, return to normal, return to normal, but normal for a lot of us is not, has not been a great place and it has not been a safe space. So the urgency is to shift what we consider to be normal. So yeah, one of the, one of the things I'm taking away from this week is, um, you know, the feeling that I belong and I'm meant to be here in this world and in this space. And um, Chief Bobby Joseph and uh, the Indigenous Yoga Collective really reminded us that we all belong here. What we've done together here this week has put all the beautiful ingredients together um, to build that kind of human connection. Yeah. To some of the hardest, the most challenging um, issues the planet has. The vaccine never delivered. I got my flu shot at Rexall and went home. So today? Mm -hmm. Oh, you're kidding! You had to wait, yeah. Good for you. Hey, hey, Sade, are you able to mute? Yeah, I just muted everyone. Great. Hey, thanks everybody. Um, if you've just joined during that video, um, that was uh, a little bit behind the scenes of our, of our staff retreat that we held in May in, on the beautiful grounds of University of British Columbia. And yeah, it gives you a little bit about what we're all trying to do in this, in this next new phase of, of Make Way, because there's been lots of exciting changes that we want to talk about. But first, I want to introduce you uh, to Denise Williams, who you saw a little bit of on that video. She formally took on the mantle of our board chair uh, this month. And uh, we're delighted, absolutely delighted to have her in this role. Denise is a strategist. She's a builder. She's a connector. Uh, she is a, a phenomenal indigenous woman leader for Turtle Island. She's Cowichan. Uh, she's taking a much, much deserved sabbatical right now for the next nine months. Um, so uh, let's all honor that, even though she's on many boards, uh, she's chosen also to stay active, uh, st stay active on the Makeway board. Uh, but, you know, this is someone who spent the past 10 years building uh, the First Nations Technology Council. Uh, and if you don't know of it, uh, it, it is essentially transforming the ways in which First Nations and Indigenous peoples across this country are kind of designing the future of uh, our digital futures. Um, and the way that she can speak about, um, you know, digital sovereignty and, and the, the ways in which our, our, you know, our work together through digital digital um, digital spaces needs to be decolonized. Um, is yeah, she's taught she's absolutely taught me a lot. She's been an advisor to the Secretary General. She's just been awarded uh, outstanding alumni by Simon Fraser University. Um, many many accolades that we could talk about, but I'm just going to let you. Uh, interact with her directly yourself. So Denise, a few words in our little fireside friends and family event. Oh, thanks so much for that, uh, Joanne. It's, it's uh, always powerful uh, to hear when you've stepped away from a role that means so much to you. It uh, means a lot to 
uh, here's some of those ways in which I tried to uh, have an impact for our people. Um, it's, it's nice to reflect on that today. So thank you for bringing that good medicine to me. Uh, thank you to all of you for being in this fireside chat uh, along with us, choosing to be in this virtual circle today. I know for some of you it's Friday, it's Friday afternoon, so appreciate your time and appreciate your energy here. I'm calling in from the sacred ancestral unceded territory at the tsleil people. This is a nation that's uh, pretty close uh, to Deep Cove or North Vancouver over here on Coast Salish territory. Uh, I call myself an uninvited cousin uh, because uh, the tsleil nation is actually closely linked with the Cowichan tribes where, where, where I'm from. So we have lots in common, including our, our language. Uh, in Cowichan tribes, we speak Hulkumalem, and in uh, Slewatoth territory, they speak Hulkumalem. Uh, so Hulkuminum, Hulkumalem, uh, subtle difference. And so our, uh, our people speak very similar language, uh, which, which is something because you might know about British Columbia, we're one of the most, if not the most, um, uh, diverse uh, territory in terms of uh, languages and family systems. Um, so it's really beautiful to be here. I've lived uh, in Tsleil-Waututh territory for three years now, but I've lived all over the shared territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people for 22 years now. Uh, I grew up uh, close to uh, the Cowichan, Cowichan tribes for some of my life, and then um, my very young years um, in Haida Gwaii territory. Um, and I was in Haida Gwaii living in uh, logging camps because my dad was one of the only um, First Nations uh, loggers in that time, in the 70s and in the 80s. And um, I grew up, you know, really understanding the impact of forestry and lived right in those camps watching old growth uh, forests be destroyed and clear cut. And I saw the impact firsthand as a young woman because, um, you know, we would see the migration of bears into, into our community as a result of us devastating their, their, uh, their habitat. And I didn't understand that obviously as a, as a, as a young kid. Um, but when I think back on um, how lucky I was to be in such an incredible supernatural place, those of you that have been to Haida Gwaii know that, it's, um, it's otherworldly and it's so important to uh, honor and to protect and to have lived there um, and to be the daughter of a father who's uh, not only a, a logger and had been logging that territory for so many years, but also a residential school survivor um, and also someone who, who taught me a lot um, about what it is uh, uh, to be a responsible um, steward of our family, our connections, uh, and the land is, is a really important and, and I guess complex sort of identity that I'm working through. And, and I, I share that with you because um, all of the work that, that I've done over the years and that I continue to focus on is about a, a reclamation of my own identity as an Indigenous woman and an Indigenous woman that comes from, um, like I say, a bit of a complicated uh, journey um, around what it means to be Indigenous on these lands. and and uh, through colonialism and, and different kinds of economic um, uh, pressures, you know, that my family felt, still feels. And so I'm just trying to understand, you know, how, what my role is and how to give um, back and uh, how to be in right relation with communities and with the work and with the philanthropic sector, which I think actually is going to be critical and, and, and pivotal in changing the narrative and changing the story. So that, that's how I you know, sort of arrived at wanting to be a, a part of Make Way. And uh, I was just thrilled to be invited to be on the board. I could have never imagined um, being asked to chair the board. It's an incredible honor for me. I'm, I'm deeply moved and um, it's not lost on me uh, how important this work is right now. And uh, being here with such a strong, um, diverse number of board members, such a incredible, um, caring, heartfelt, intentional, wise group of individuals that make up the Make Way team um, and led by Joanna, 
um, who's been an absolute inspiration to me is, is, is uh, just like I say, it's just, it's such an honor. So thank you for being here to kind of witness and honor and celebrate um, all that is, all that is make way. I'm really excited uh, to invite you into the discussion today on, on make way's new strategic plan um, to celebrate together, to deepen uh, our connection um, as we advance uh, our mission with all the incredible communities and, and people that we're working with today and the many more that we hope will join us um, uh, on the path moving forward. And um, just to say, our, our, our board is absolutely committed to inclusive and progressive uh, governance practices. And, and a part of those efforts include advancing accessibility and transparency in all the work we do and how we do it. Um, we want to create as many opportunities as possible for you as our friends, uh, our dear family and relatives to, to engage uh, in the work because we know working together is key to achieving the mission. Um, so thanks for showing up today and being a part of the discussion and, and walking, this, walking this path with us. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it there and, and, and back over to uh, uh, Joanna and the team for questions and comments and, and anything you'd like to share your wisdom uh, uh, today. So again, hi, Scott, thank you for being here today. Hi, thanks, Denise. Yeah, so we really wanted to keep this um, quite informal. Um, and so I was just going to give a couple of updates based on a bunch of questions that I tend to get. And so hopefully I'm going to land uh, a, a few of them for you. And then we'll just open it up. People can take off their mute and ask questions or they can throw them into the chat. And we'll, you know, we'll wrap at the top of the hour. And yeah, this is our, this is an experiment in just kind of opening us up and, and kind of ask us anything. And we've invited uh, project directors, we've invited uh, donor advised fund holders, community advised fund holders, key partners. And um, we're just really thrilled uh, that, you've, that, that, you've, that you've joined us here today. Let me start with just honing in on this first slide of uh, this was this first and only slide. Shade, if you can throw it up, it's really our, our kind of the strategic seven strategic priorities of our new plan. And so, um, yeah, so this, you know, for more than a 20 year existence of this organization, it really was built more or less to be kind of a, a tools and services provider to the not-for-profit, to the charitable sector. And it didn't really have a compass as to the change that it wanted to um, help uh, catalyze in the world. And because of the kind of ongoing demand for so many of our services and the crisis of biodiversity and climate and inequality, we knew we actually needed to get clear on a North Star. What is it that we're trying to achieve in the world? So we went through this process and really landed on these seven priorities. And then so many of our tools are really there to help us advance these seven priorities. And they are very much interconnected. Um, there could have been many ways in which we could have sliced and diced um, the way we talk about this work but this is how we've landed. And so this is our three-year strategy. And so healthy lands and waters um, is probably clear to you all, but so much of the work that we're doing there around supporting uh, and advancing indigenous protected and conservation areas. Uh, bold inclusive leadership for healing and justice. This is really about the work that we do around creating safe spaces uh, and capacity supports and wraparound supports for leaders who are really trying to advance, um, you know, indigenous sovereignty, uh, transforming uh, the ways in which we work on, on, uh, on protecting nature, um, you know, big focus now on women's leadership, obviously a, a long time focus on indigenous leadership, increasing focus on how it supports to black leaders uh, in the environmental space. Um, you know, I could say so much about all of these, all of these pieces. 
Indigenous Authority Language and Cultural Resurgence. This is an area of work that we've been funding um, lots of different groups and communities, particularly in, in the North, across all the territories in the North, and as well as in Northern Manitoba and in British Columbia. Again, this is listening to communities that have been kind of affected by a lot of conservation and environmental focus that hasn't actually respected the ways in which communities want to focus on cultural resurgence and language resurgence as in and of itself as a way to their economic and 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 economic well-being and their cultural well-being and we know that if we support indigenous cultural and language resurgence it will actually ultimately lead to um, stewardship uh, of, of, of lands and waters. These are, these are completely interconnected. Shared wealth and economic be well-being. Again, the need to really figure out how do we move forward with like conservation-based um, economies, but also really how do we tackle um, the, the growing divide uh, between classes in this country coming up with solutions and, and amplifying new solutions where that's concerned. Food systems and, and indigenous food sovereignty has long been an area of work, but after COVID, we received so many more, um, during COVID, we received so much more food funding because so many of the food oriented organizations didn't have the capacity to get money into Northern remote or indigenous communities. Um, this is again an area of our work that we really can center um, food as a place to build culture, to advance um, uh, work for, for, for young people in so many Indigenous communities, but also fight for new policies that actually defend Indigenous food sovereignty like in the North where you, know, you have a, a very backward approach to kind of uh, 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 subsidizing Northern food stores when in fact we should be supporting hunters to get out onto the land. Fair earth living and climate action. This is a real focus for us to figure out a niche where so much funding around climate action has been um, uh, not necessarily focused on the cultures and behavior changes that we want to uh, catalyze. And so this is a partnership with One, uh, with, uh, One Earth um, that has been working at the community level to help neighborhoods and communities and municipalities figure out how to shift ways of doing and systems and policies. So you'll hear more from us on that. And then finally, it's how can we be disruptors around the charitable sector and the philanthropic sector so that it is more accessible, that it is more fair, um, that it is working for people and planet. Um, one staggering piece of data is that six, over 60% of charitable revenue is spent on 1% of charities. Um, you've heard other shocking stats about how less than uh, one cent is uh, of a dollar is spent uh, on for black led organizations or in, in black communities, um, a same very tiny proportion of money is going into indigenous communities. So again, how can we help write that? So that's kind of our, 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 our seven uh, priority areas. You can take that slide down Sade. But some of the other major questions that we've been getting of late are, didn't you guys received a major grant from Mackenzie Scott? And what are you guys doing with it? Um, and also, didn't you receive a big fund from um, the BC government on uh, uh, for indigenous uh, watershed protection? So uh, yeah, let me speak to let me speak to those. So on the latter, um, in at the end of March, we did receive 15 million from, from the BC government. And I'm happy to say that that team hustled so quickly and already $6 million is out in community um, to support indigenous communities around watershed 
protection, security, et cetera. And more to the point, the work that is, is, is we're trying to um, really hone in on is how do we make sure that there's long-term funding for overall watershed security in, in that region. But with regards to the Mackenzie Scott gift, um, it was a surprise to be uh, approached by her due diligence team that you soon find out who, she, who they're working on behalf of. Uh, yeah, and then to get that call at the beginning of March to say that, yes, we were, we were being given a 15 million US unrestricted grant, um, probably one of the best calls I've had in my, in my career. But, you know, that's a huge responsibility. What do you do with a unrestricted grant? How do you leverage it? Um, so we set about talking to folks, a lot of you uh, we spoke to, um, how do we apply these funds? And so we had literally just approved the strategy. And so one, two key priorities for us was make sure we center the strategy um, and we work with the priorities and the outcomes and vision set out in the new strategy. Um, but also how could we use it to leverage? You know, how could, how could you grow this pot? How could you help others grow their pot um, by use of this money? So those were two um, real criteria for us. So for this year alone, we've set aside um, about 8 million of that pot that is essentially 19 million Canadian. Um, we, uh, 2.8 million of it, we are setting aside over three years in a kind of a, a kind of a, a R and D fund R and D that is really around establishing new uh, initiatives, but also to really invest in some of that kind of capital investments that are like the strong core of make way. So that's 2.8 million. And then over, uh, then there's over 5 million that we've also committed. And uh, so some of that is to, wrap around the supports for our shared platform projects. So we have set aside a million dollars of, of that 5 million to that are going to be granted out in unrestricted funds to the projects on our shared platform. And so there's a survey out or about to go out that's really going to ask all of those projects on what are the critical needs, how could this best be leveraged, um, and, and you know, how, how, can, how can you as projects use it in a, in a real catalytic way. Then we had a, a chunk of money that we basically said, let's get it fast out the door right now to existing collaboratives, you know, structures that are already in place that don't need extra staff or support or anything else that can be very, very responsive funding. So those went into a lot of um, existing funding collaboratives that, that make way hosts and work on new work to really kind of expand out some of the work around food or, you know, where we have a small pot of money that is supporting women and girls in the North, we were able to throw a couple hundred thousand dollars towards that this year. And then um, the last area is really to kind of seed some of the new areas of work in our strategy. So that is, uh, for example, um, we're really hoping to um, set up a whole grant making program in Northern Saskatchewan. And so um, a, a group of our folks have been out listening and consulting and actually just had a big meeting in Northern Saskatchewan last year to see how we can get um, a grant making program that really meets the needs of primarily indigenous communities in Saskatchewan. So that's the other kind of basket of work that, that, the, that the money um, went into. So then people will say, well, you know, there's an urgent climate crisis. Isn't all of this money going to address that? So there are, of course, many um, projects on the shared platform that are addressing climate and they are uh, eligible to, to the, some of these leveraged funds, uh, these funds to, to leverage um, their activities. But I would say um, kind of the two other areas that Makeway is really trying to tackle the climate crisis. 
One is through this, what we refer to fair earth living, this funder collaborative to harness way more money to focus in on that, that kind of, um, you know, the, 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 the change that needs to happen at, at the behavior and the culture level. Um, and so if you, if you have a second to go to www.fairearthliving.ca, that spells out all those areas of funding priorities that we want to focus on. But probably where most of our money is going around climate is essentially indigenous led nature-based climate solutions. We are investing in, because we're being invited in, to more and more indigenous protected conservation areas and marine protected areas, all of which will have very, very important relevance to, uh, to, to climate change. Um, and, you know, most recently, uh, the Meshkegawak Tribal Council in Ontario's north has asked us to work with them to help coordinate a number of philanthropists as, as well as a number and funding to support their protected area, like the size of France. And these peatlands are essential, essential for our entire planet. Uh, there's many environmental groups that are also very, very focused on this area, but the Meshkegawak have asked us to help them bring in funny, uh, funding, uh, coordinate um, funding with um, many philanthropic organizations, as well as uh, hopefully more money from the feds and the province around that. So that gives you an idea um, on that. You know, so much of, of what I've talked about is kind of the what, but so much of also what Makeway does is the how, and it's confusing what we do because there's all of these priorities, but then there's the shared platform, then there's the collaboratives, there's the grant making, there's the impact investing. And, um, you know, we really, we really, um, you know, see that there is so much opportunity. Take, for example, you know, donor advised funds, which we've hosted roughly about 140 donor advised funds. We would consider ourselves a boutique around donor advised funds um, because there are, you know, many big players, including um, community foundations that host donor advised funds, but also uh, financial institutions that do that. So what would be our you know, our unique space for this, where we can take on our personality, which is both daring and reliable. And that's really to move into um, what we're calling community advised funds. So again, shifting the power, can money come into a fund that is essentially advised by the community and not by the philanthropist? So we're now up to seven uh, community advised funds in this area. And um, we hope that we can help communities build many, many more so that the communities themselves can be grant making through a fund like a donor advice fund um, operates. Um, similarly, we're trying to be um, as, as ambitious, daring and reliable around our impact investment strategy, our overall investment strategy. So, uh, Tides Canada at the time was probably one of the first foundations to go fossil free. Um, and there are many foundations, maybe some of them are part of this call, who are also trying to be way more ambitious in the impact space. So what is it that we could be doing more of to align our investment in line with our seven strategic priority areas, where we are really going to be looking more you know, this is this is a small a small pot that we hold on to, but can we be really strategic in how we in how we leverage it? And similar similarly with our shared platform, you know, the, it has grown so large. You know, there are over three hundred and fifty staff as part of the projects of the shared platform. And there's probably another 100 to 150 contractors that are part of the shared platform. Um, 75 projects uh, sit there. There is something like a $25 million spend that is happening uh, last year on the shared platform. And the demand for that, the services that we provide through that um, is, is 
is always there. It's ever growing. So right now we're kind of on hold. We're not opening the door to any new initiatives. We just don't have the capacity, um, but we're also really trying to take care of some of the back end systems and improvements to, to ensure that we are really providing the supports that, that, that these amazing community um, initiatives leaders are, are, are advancing. Um, there's me also many large, complex indigenous um, organizations that sit on the platform, Nawalak being one of them that has grown in leaps and bounds. It now has 90 staff. It's the largest employer in Alert Bay on Vancouver Island uh, that is providing language and culture camps to both elders and young people. Um, so that just gives you a sense of kind of where, we, where we've gone with this. It's not just the two or three person little projects that are needing, needing a home, but th there are now large organizations um, that also have um, uh, capital, um, you know, like the IPCA Innovation Program that uh, purchased the Tofina Botanical Gardens and is a campus for uh, learning about how indigenous protected conservation areas can grow across Turtle Island. So as you can see, vast amounts of activity. Um, what are the challenges you might say? Well, it's meeting, it's meeting demand. Um, we need to slow down on a lot of stuff, but the urgency is evident. Um, you know, disinformation out there continues to drive new false narratives. Luckily, we're out from, you know, the, the Kenny and Krauss narrative. Uh, and I, we feel like we're on the front foot being able to tell the stories of all the great work that Make Way is doing. Uh, but those things are kind of always out there in the, in, in the, in the, uh, in the wings. Um, but I think, I think the big challenge this next year is going to be, you know, the real drop in charitable giving. We've seen something like a 22 drop, 22% 22 drop across the sector uh, since last year. And with growing inflation, uh, that's likely to, to grow. Uh, and yet the demand is, is ever growing. Um, so, you know, these are very, very turbulent times. Uh, as I like to say, change is the only constant. Um, but certainly make way is trying to kind of build the resilience to be able to support the kind of leaders and communities that are doing the most phenomenal work. And, you know, that's just, you know, this isn't a job. This is, this is probably the best gig I've ever had because of the amazing things that we, that we get to participate in every single day. So I'm going to leave it there and just now open it up. Um, Denise, if you wanted to say anything or anybody wants to throw a question in to the chat or um, yeah, I'll just shut up. <laughs> or you want to put your hand up. Anything you're curious about. It's Burkhardt here. Let me try. How are hey, you? Burkhardt. Um, let me uh, ask you sort of a typical uh, question people ask in sports, which are always, you know, easy questions. And then let me ask you a more difficult one. Um, the easy one is how, how has the brand change been received? What kind of challenges have you had from going from tides to make way? Mm -hmm. um, I still say tides sometimes and I have to apologize. It's okay. It's just years of use, but just, I'd be curious to hear a little bit about the experience of changing the brand. Um, I think it has gone extremely well. Um, it's, yeah, there are people like you uh, who basically slip back, but, but it was not just changing the brand, but also getting really clear on our mission when we did that, you know, so that, that we were, we could now, everybody now can say what our mission statement is in one statement, in one sentence. Our mission is to help, um, to build, sorry, to build partnerships and solutions to help communities and nature thrive together. So we're very clear about building partnerships and solutions to help communities and nature thrive together. So 
being out there and being clear about that, that there, there is that North star. And then this last strategy has been like, then, so what does that mean? That's kind of the next layer. It's not that we're just this agnostic tool provider for the charitable sector. We're clear on a mission. And so it has, we, and as somebody asked me the other day, you know, we, we spent, we have been able to spend much less time fighting the battle of the, of like, are you connected to tides? Are you that, you know, are you the one moving, you know, money to landlock Alberta oil? We, we just don't spend our time there. We spend all of our time telling the stories of what we are actually doing. And so it's been very, very successful that more and more people actually could see us as an enabler and not kind of under attack. 11 years under audit. Um, and then of course, many, many years of, of trying to deal with, with the Krauss and Kenny narrative. And we're, we're out, we're well out beyond that. So highly, highly, highly positive um, piece. And yeah, I, I, I can't, I can't, I can't recommend it more. If you're, if you're in that situation, it's, you know, it, it, it's an opportunity to, to get, to get known for what you are, as opposed to not have to say what you're not, which is what we kept having to do. Of course. Okay. So the next one is maybe perhaps a bit more challenging and I hope you take it in the spirit that it's. Uh, Absolutely. Fun. Challenge us. Um, your strategic directions. Yeah. There's a lot there. Mm -hmm. seven huge goals are you not worried sort of to drive yourself a little too thin by trying to do too much um so here's the thing about that i guess i've been part of many many strategic plans across many very very large institutions um you know running a very large international ngo all the rest of it because we are so diverse and dispersed and that the work is going to happen anyway, let's just name it. Mm. And so I have learned from other strategic plans where you spent all this time trying to get it, wrestle it down to four or five, but the work ends up happening over there anyway. And let's be clear, not all seven priorities are gonna have the same level of activity, right? I would say around healthy lands and waters, transforming food systems, indigenous authority, culture and language. Those three probably have the most amount of activity. That's the most amount of legacy. Um, and those other areas are ones that we are building. And we might find that, you know, we, uh, we, you know, we can't deliver on them all, but there, there is absolutely activity happening in all seven. Um, and yeah, it's, you don't have to remember all seven. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can I ask a quick follow-up question then? Um, and thank you for that answer. That doesn't make sense. So as you go forward in executing those seven strategic priorities, mm -hmm. and as you report to your members, your, your stakeholders, your your friends, your families, mm -hmm. will you then report on those seven categories? You know, the accomplishments, the challenges, the money spent, people employed, number of shared platform uh, participants and so on? Um, yes, but maybe not according to all of those indicators. But indeed, we are, um, so we just gave the board a progress report against the plan with all the, of the outcomes. And we also know that we need to kind of figure out what are the proxies of impact mm. across, across all of that that could really demonstrate to us that we're actually having the kind of transformational systems change impact in the world. And we're also uh, developing terms of reference for external research team to accompany make way along the way so that we can understand where we're really having impact alongside our strategy. Um, again, 
we really committed to trust-based philanthropy. We don't want to be extracted to uh, the communities with which we work. We don't want to impose a you know results-based framework that you know has to count how many bums are in seats and all the rest of it. I used to come from international development, and that process was just terrible. So we want we want to be able to figure out truly how we can learn and you know progress along the way and of course our accountability is to our board our our friends our family our partners along along the way so thanks for those really strategic questions for all right thank you lewis go ahead so I have a donor advised fund and you know, when I listen to you, mm -hmm. I think, what's the point of them? In other words, you know, I mean, I know why I mm -hmm. do what I do, mm -hmm. but I, you know, I can imagine an awful lot of the stuff that I'm uh, donating to through, through make way mm -hmm. doesn't really fit into the strategic plan. So is it, uh, useful to make way to have so many donor advised funds? Um, it's a great question. And it's, um, I, I, would, I would be hard pressed to believe that everything that you're donating to doesn't have some relevance to our strategy. I would, <laughs> I would be hard pressed to believe that. And I mean, people who come to us are often looking for that kind of boutique, um, also wanting to learn what's happening in, in the sector. A lot of people come wanting to, uh, wanting to be part of something that is nationally focused, you know? And so, um, you, know, your, your, you know, your donor advised fund is absolutely essential to, you know, us being able to invest it in ways that kind of advance the mission. Um, but also, you know, what we learned from you in terms of your grant making. And uh -huh. Leanne Burton is right there. Of course, she's there. You know, I, you know, I could flip the question to her, but I want you to hear from me that, you know, every single person who parks a fund at Make Way, they're part of a system. They are part of a family that is that we're trying to advance change. We're trying to advance the system um, together. So does it ever, uh, it must happen that, uh, you know, a donor advised fund does X or Y, and then you jump in and make it better, more? Um, the, our staff are always, always available to both advise you on how to be strategic. And yes, can we match uh, if, if there is something that you think could, could help increase the impact? Those are conversations that we're super keen to have with you all, for sure. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thanks very much. Yeah. Thanks, Lewis. I have a question. It's Jane. Uh, I work with Shorefast, which is an organization that most people don't know the name of. And so when I describe where I work, I often need to start with Fogo Island. And so we're the charity behind Fogo Island Inn, which many of you might know. Um, and so we're not new as an organization, but we are new to expanding our work beyond our shores on Fogo Island. And mm -hmm. so we're definitely in a moment of, um, you know, greater ambition. I love your words. I wrote them down here. What was it? The reliable, but- um, And daring and daring yeah and so you know we are in this moment of really trying to scale our work so that mm -hmm. the impact is about how do we get these kind of ideas proliferating across mm -hmm. the country mm -hmm. um but we're little known mm -hmm. and we have you know we have a number of kind of strategies that we're thinking about and working towards to change that but one of the questions i have is just you know how does an organization sort of get on the radar of your of your team in terms of your advisors for donor advised funds? As in if like to, to receive funding for, yeah. yes. Yeah. 
Yes. So, I mean, that's, that's a real um, issue for us is that kind of when we started, it was, it was always kind of a commitment that we wouldn't necessarily pitch ideas mm -hmm. to the donors who, who hold their funds. Um, that being said, you know, we want to be able to create a much, a much more kind of opportunities of learning of great opportunities because we see them literally every single day and Shorefast is a perfect example of trying to kind of save save small towns right you know like the the, the economic uh, agenda that you folks all have in terms of trying to to save small community economies um, that's something that should be critical to all of us um, across this country. Um, and, and so we're, you know, uh, uh, we're hoping to kind of create much more of a portal of ideas so that, you know, ideas can get pitched to any of the donors in the advised funds. Um, but similarly, we have these other funds that we're building through other institutional funders, right? So, you know, Jane, you're always welcome to come and talk to us to say, how, where and how do I find money? Because um, we do that all the time for folks, you know, just trying to build those connections between philanthropy and change makers. And so, um, you know, and, and how to help build your brand. We're also having gone through that process. We're also happy to have those conversations with you guys as well. Great. The projects are a portal of ideas. Yes. Exactly. 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 The shared platform projects. Any other questions from folks? Nobody should be shy. You can throw it into the chat. Joanna. Maybe while we're waiting, I could just okay. add a little bit on to the Please. what you um, put so nicely around the the community and donor advised funds. Um, Say who you are so everybody knows. Oh yeah, I should. I, although I know a lot of people here, but there are a few new faces. My name is Leanne Burton, and I'm the director of philanthropic services with Make Way. Um, and I'm calling in from my new uh, place of residence in Brantford, Ontario, uh, right adjacent to the Six Nations of the Grand River Reserve, which I'm new to, but I really look forward to learning a lot more about the land and the people and the histories of this beautiful place. Um, I have been working on the Community and Donor Advised Fund Program uh, for the last year, trying to do some landscape research. Um, it's a little bit difficult because there's not a lot of data around uh, donor advised funds in, in Canada. There's a little bit more that's coming out of the US and some privately commissioned data. Um, but what we found through our own primary data or primary and secondary research was that um, donor advised funds tend to be a little bit of a, um, a non-transparent sort of ecosystem of philanthropy that the public doesn't know a lot about. Um, but they're also really critical to be able to advance a future where hopefully philanthropy will no longer be needed. That's really kind of the, the direction that we all should be trying to run in here. Um, and so we thought about ways that we could uh, refine the program, the community or the donor advised fund program. And so one way was uh, opening up something that we'd already been doing for a long time, which was community advised funds and, and creating this as a uh, uh, an optional mechanism for some of the community partners that we work with who already have relationships with funders. Um, and the other way is also to be much more transparent uh, about the number and the type of funds that we uh, facilitate through Make Way. And so uh, by the end of this fall, we should see a, a publicly available list of the number and type of funds that we have and the balances and annual disbursements, protecting the donor anonymity of course, um, that's something that we would do from an ethical standpoint, um, regardless um, of wanting to be transparent. 
Um, and then hopefully over the course of the next few months, uh, we'll be working with many of the advisors and asking them if they would be interested in uh, disclosing their, uh, their identity with the fund, if they would like to, if not, it's completely up to them and we will support them either way. But also if they would be open to indicating online if they're open to inquiries for funding, which you don't typically see at a lot of um, other uh, fund, uh, uh, fund hosting entities, if you will. And then Similarly, we would like for the community advised funds and the projects to be able to indicate if they are looking for funding and what kind of funding. And from there, we'd like to create an ecosystem of healthy pathways between funders and community partners um, where we can enable uh, much more interaction and co-creation together. So I just wanted to share that because this is really exciting and something that we'll be focusing on for the balance of the year. And if, there's a lot of really great brains here, I can tell. So if you want to talk with me about this um, or you have other ideas, I'm happy to chat. Brilliant. Thank you. That's great. Anything else from anybody? You're all so shy. I love it. I think it just might be a testament to how how clear and excellent everything was uh, presented, <laughs> Joanna and McQuaid team. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I I have to say this is this is probably one of the more complex organizations in the charitable sector, just because we are two legal entities and that we do so much, um, but we hope that we can continue to build this kind of transparency and clarity. And Gail, I see you've got your hand up. Welcome. Um, yeah, it's not, a, it's not so much a question, but I just really wanted to um, just speak my appreciation. I've, I come from the research community, so I'm, I research climate action, and I'm involved with uh, the Fair Earth Living component of our, of our beautiful mandala that you presented. Um, but all week, you know, for weeks, actually, I've been studying. And in, in the case of Vancouver, um, policy making that occurs from within regimes that are essentially unsustainable. And so we do things and it, it almost looks like it might get us there, but it actually reproduces the very logics that don't. And you know, some, some scholars in, in Scandinavia are willing to say, hey, that approach fails. Like if you look at it writ large for sustainability and justice. And so what are the pathways to do policymaking in this case, you know, but in your case, it's grant making, you know, outside of these regimes that are, are fundamentally like flawed. Um, and so I've been kind of thinking of it as a bit like, a razor's edge, like to, you need to kind of gather public and political support sufficient to give rise to something, but then you also need to kind of stretch and transform. And so when you kind of gather that, that up with the, with, the, with, this, with the explication of your how being daring but reliable, I was like, oh my God, that's it. You know, and so I'm just honored that you're doing this in the case of grant making for Canada. Like this is our our main foundation and I, I just feel so impressed and like very honored to be part of this so that's all I wanted to say it's not so much a question and I'm, I'm a little hesitant because um, I feel grateful to be here but that's th those were the words that I that came to me as you were ah. speaking. Thank you so much Gail I really I really really appreciate it and yeah and we have I, I think it's it, it, it's it, you give me the opportunity to say that you know, we are we are also way more committed in this strategy to have relationship with researchers. And mm -hmm. so on on many of the priority areas, we're actually building partnerships with researchers mm -hmm. so that we we do get beyond um, old ways of thinking and ensure that our our grant making is is informed, but we're also trying to transgress um in, in terms of the ways in which we can shift the systems so um really great people are starting to sign off there's one minute before five so everybody thank you so much for joining us uh this was a pure experiment it was denise's idea 
another one of her brilliant ideas. Uh, and so um, we hope to make this kind of an annual affair. Uh, and you'll hear from more people than just me, uh, because there's just, as you saw from the opening video, amazing people across, but we just thought we'd keep it super simple this time. So thanks again, everybody have a beautiful weekend for wherever you are and stay, stay in touch, stay in touch with us. Thanks so much, everybody.